Today we read from Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 43. And before we read God's word, would you read this assertion of God's word with me? This is the word of God. It teaches, it corrects, it reproves, it trains in righteousness. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Hear God's word to us. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The beginnings of the self-help industry could be traced to a book that was written in 1859 by a man by the name of Samuel Smiles. Published the same year as Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species, Smiles' book was simply entitled Self-Help. In a time of great change and upheaval, Smiles' notion of a self-made person caught the imagination of many. As did his contention, heaven helps those who help themselves. Some of you thought that was in here, didn't you? <laughs> Today, the self-help industry is worth over $10 billion. Expanded from books to television shows to blogs to workshops to retreats and seminars and TED Talks, all in an effort to help people improve their productivity, get better sleep, improve their love lives, their parenting, you name it. And it's clear that we as a people are far too aware of how far we fall short of the standards of beauty and success and happiness that are always around us. And we would give just about anything for 10 easy steps or five new habits that would save us from ourselves. Save us. Save yourself. That phrase appears three different times in the passage we just read. All said to Jesus. If you are the Messiah, well then save yourself. If you're the king of the Jews, mock the soldiers, then save yourself. Even one of the criminals hung on a cross next to him, says derisively, if you are the Messiah, then save yourself and us. Over the course of his earthly life, Jesus had performed signs and wonders. He had tamed nature. He had calmed the storms. He had walked on water. He healed people of their illnesses and cast out demons from those who were within their grip. 
He fed thousands with the lunch of one young man and turned barrels of water into the finest wine. Crowds had begun to flock around him to hear his powerful sermons and his down-to-earth stories. They had begun to believe that he was truly the Son of God. And now he hangs on a cross. Abandoned by those who are closest to him. Held tightly in the grip of the Roman authorities that are ready to squeeze the very life out of his lungs. Vulnerable and bleeding and surrounded by taunts and insults. Perhaps he heard the echoes of Satan's voice at his own temptation. If you truly are the Son of God, well, feed yourself, claim your power, defy the laws of gravity and mortality. Come on, Jesus, if you really are who you say you are, prove it. The same taunts that Jesus hears beneath the cross. He saved others, let him save himself. Save yourself, Jesus. Save yourself and us while you're at it. It may seem strange that this is the passage that we read on this Sunday prior to the Advent season. But in the church calendar, this is the last Sunday of the year. It's called Christ the King Sunday. It's an invitation for us to once again claim that Jesus is Savior and Messiah, to worship him as king, to kneel before his throne. But when we read this scripture today, we don't see an exalted king. We see a Christ being crucified. Now, throughout the story, there are symbols of royalty, royal power, but none of them are really attributed to Jesus or his power. Above Jesus' head, Pilate has posted a sign, King of the Jews. It's not a title. It's just a reminder of the charge against him. Jesus has been lifted up, but not on a throne, on a cross, The crown he wears is made of thorns. The places at his right and left, those places normally reserved for power and honor, are occupied by two thieves being put to death with him. And his royal court, made up of those who would offer Jesus a sour wine as they mock him and gamble for his clothes. What kind of king is this? And maybe more to the point, what do we do with a king like this? One who refused to save himself from the cross and one who doesn't seem to want to save us from our own crosses either. What kind of king would allow such suffering to exist in our world? Now, Jesus is not the sort of king that we expect. And maybe he isn't the king we really want, if we're honest with ourselves. But this crucified king should not surprise us as we will remind ourselves and the community in just two short weeks, Jesus was born of a poor teenage young lady into a world that could find no room for his bed. And when she sang songs to him, they were songs about a king who would scatter the proud and who would bring the powerful down from their thrones. They were songs about lifting up the lowly and giving the hungry good things to eat. As an adult, the friends this king would gather around him were a motley crew of impulsive people, somewhat slow on the uptake, and who would abandon him 
at his greatest hour of need. He ate dinner with anyone who would invite him at tables and on hillsides, rich and poor, sinner and righteous alike. This king would preach about how the first would be last and the last would be first, how the greatest among us is the servant of all. This king talked about turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, and giving up your coat and maybe even your shirt. This king told those who would listen that anyone who wanted to save their life would lose it. But anyone who would lose their lives for his sake, well, they would discover what salvation really means. You see, it turns out Jesus wasn't ever playing by the rules that we've all agreed to in order to make it through this crazy world. You know, the rules about winning and losing and survival of the fittest. Instead, he turns those rules on their heads to upend the power structures of his day and ours and to teach those who would follow God that God is with them, not just in their victory and in their power, but also in their defeats and in their darkest hour. Jesus refused to save himself because he was here to save us. And the salvation that he offers is not a get out of pain free card. He did not come to rescue us from being human. He came to be human and to dwell within our humanity, to experience it all, even to the very end. You know, frankly, it's it's easier to read a self-help book than it is to read the gospel. Because knowing what we know, we would prefer to be our own rulers, take charge of our own lives, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Thank you very much. Because at least then we'd have a little bit of hope that through our own efforts, we might be able to avoid that kind of pain. But in the moments when we finally realize that we cannot save ourselves, We give thanks to this sort of God who meets us in the depths of our own brokenness and sin and comes to us with words of forgiveness. Looking out over the crowds at the foot of his cross, Jesus saw powerful men who had made horrible decisions. Soldiers still holding the hammers that drove the nails into his hands and feet those who denied ever knowing him, those mocking him and those who stood silently in the face of his pain. And he sees us there too. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. In the moments when we realize that we cannot fix or repair, or help ourselves. When we find ourselves completely unable to do anything more than simply cry out, then we give thanks for a God who does not abandon us or leave us. Jesus, remember me, the other criminal begs. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. When the self-help books and the seminars fall short and we're confronted with our need for one more powerful than ourselves, that's when we cry out to God. Remember me, remake me, restore me, reclaim me. And we hear those words today you will be with me in paradise. 
At the cross, we are confronted with the great mystery of a God whose power is made perfect in weakness. We're confronted by a God who humbles himself even to the point of suffering and death. And this is the great hope of our faith and the great promise of our God, that Jesus reigns both in joy and in sorrow, in power and in pain, in beauty and in the brokenness of life. We find a king who assures us that in spite of, not because of our best efforts, we are saved and we are remembered and we are forgiven. Would you pray with me?